Welcome to Physics Next Book. In today's video, we shall discuss why we cannot beat the speed of light in free space. The traditional answer to this question utilizes the concept of the object's relativistic mass, which diverges to infinity as the object's speed grows closer and closer to the speed of light. This means the faster the object moves, higher grows its relativistic mass. More mass means more resistance to the object's motion. So as the object grows faster and faster, it becomes increasingly harder to further speed it up. This is the staple explanation. It's quick, easy and efficient. It's great. However, at the heart of this explanation lies the concept of relativistic mass, which originally appeared when somebody handled the relativistic definition of momentum poorly. You can check out the video in the iCard for details later. The ballpark message in there is, if you think of mass as an inherently scalar property of an object, it's got to be the rest mass, which has nothing to do with its speed or velocity. To be fair, relativistic mass has its usage, but it is not a great idea that can go into the formulation of a fundamental theory from scratch. So I'd be happier not to rely on relativistic mass to explain something as important as the impenetrable speed of light barrier in special relativity. So let's look for some other line of argument, shall we? One good place to start looking can be the postulates of special relativity themselves. Never hurts to go back to the basics, right? So what do they say? The first postulate is about the laws of physics being the same in all inertial frames. Nothing specific to light or the speed of light in here. Moreover, its content was in essence already there in the Galilean or Newtonian version of relativity, the pre-relativistic relativity so to speak. Back then, physics was all about motion of bodies because electromagnetism and the nuclear interaction forces were yet to be discovered. What makes special relativity special and so markedly different from Galilean relativity is the second postulate about the speed of light. It goes like the speed of light in free space as measured by different inertial observers in their respective frames is always the same constant C. It's a universal constant. Experiments determine the value of C to be roughly 300,000 kilometers per second. To explain why this is the maximum value of speed possible, we first need to remind ourselves that speed or velocity depends on the observer's perspective. Imagine yourself sitting in an airport coffee shop looking at a passenger walking on one of those horizontally moving escalators. You are an observer in the inertial frame S, the airport frame. The escalator is a second inertial frame, let's say S prime, moving with a uniform velocity v0 with respect to the S frame. If the passenger is walking at a speed v prime on the escalator, his speed is v prime with respect to S prime and v0 plus v prime with respect to your S frame. From your perspective, his actual walking speed v prime is enhanced to v by the escalator's speed v0. This is referred to as the velocity addition theorem. Oh, just to clarify. I am randomly shuffling between speed and velocity because we are considering motion in a single direction only. Ok, so we see velocities may get added up depending on the perspective of the observer. Can this help us observe an object surpassing the speed of light? All we need is a frame S' which is moving with respect to our S frame at say half the speed of light, so V0 is C by 2, and some object moving with 3 fourth the speed of light with respect to this S prime frame, that is V prime is 3 fourth of C. Should the two add up as per the velocity addition rule, we in our S frame should see the object move 25% faster than light. Sadly, this plan does not work. It does not work because the velocity addition theorem is no longer a simple addition of velocities when we are talking about high enough velocities, as high as half or 3 fourth the speed of light and so on. In that scenario, we need to reassess how V and V prime relate to each other. The underlying reason for this is, you guessed it, right? The second postulate, which ensures that clocks in S and S prime frames tick at noticeably different rates when their relative velocity V0 is very high. You may look up the details in an earlier video I made, link is in the cards and description. Moreover, measured value of spatial distance covered is also different in S and S prime. We can readily see this in the Lorentz transformation equations. Beta here is the relative speed v0 between s and s prime, written in units of light speed, that is v by c, and gamma is the corresponding Lorentz factor. 
a dedicated video on the physical meaning of this Lorentz factor is linked in the cards, you know, for your ready reference. Anyway, the Lorentz transformation equations show how for a given event P, its space and time coordinates X and T in S frame are related to its space and time coordinates X prime and T prime in S prime frame. Since these equations are linear in the space and time coordinates, that is no x square or x cube or xt or t square and t cube type of terms are in here, we can write them for coordinate differences or coordinate differentials as well. These differentials represent changes in the space and time coordinates. So basically, we get how the spatial distance between the two events and the time needed to cover that distance as measured in s and s prime frame are related. Now, Velocity or speed is just the time rate of change of position, right? So, taking the ratio of changes in position dx and change in time cdt, we get the velocity in units of flight speed, that is v by c in s frame. On the right hand side of the equation, we have to endure a little algebra, uh, 8 standard tops, to express things in terms of v prime, the velocity in s prime frame, and v0, the relative velocity between s and s prime. This is the relativistic version of the velocity addition theorem, telling us how v and v prime relate according to the Lorentz transformation equations, which in turns are consequences of the postulates of relativity. See that apart from the usual addition of two velocities in the numerator, there is this factor in the denominator which always gives the resultant velocity v below c. Do take note of what the velocity addition theorem really does. It takes the observed velocity of an object from one inertial frame to the next. You are free to choose the relative speed between the frames and the speed of the object in the initial frame as close to the speed of light as you want, but the object's velocity in the transformed final frame always turns out to be less than c. This means we cannot have an inertial frame where the velocity dx dt of an object will appear to be higher than the speed of light. Note that. The velocity addition theorem works perfectly for all possible values of velocities. When the velocity v0 and v prime are small compared to c, the factor in the denominator is practically 1. That gives us our familiar velocity addition formula where the velocities just add up. On the other end of the spectrum, if you think of observers in s and s prime measuring the speed of a photon, both should get c according to the second postulate. See how using v prime equals c in the velocity addition theorem, v, the measured speed of photon in the s frame turns out to be c2 for any value of the relative velocity v0 between s and s prime. Does this mean we have proven the second postulate? No, no, definitely not. This is a consistency check, not a proof, since we got the velocity addition from the Lorentz transformation equations, which came from the postulates of special relativity to begin with. At this point, you may ask, why have we taken this changing to another inertial frame tactics to try to beat the speed of light? Can't we just accelerate the object? Well, no matter how much you accelerate to increase the velocity of the object, that velocity is with reference to one particular inertial frame. Go to a different inertial frame and the velocity will have either a higher or a lower value. So what we really need to show is there is no inertial frame, none at all where the object's velocity is more than the speed of light. The relativistic velocity addition theorem does exactly that. That's it for this video. Do let me know in the comments if you have found something useful in here. I shall see you in the next one. Meanwhile, check out the video on the right to see how you can obtain the Lorentz transformation equations using a space-time diagram with every step making physical sense. This approach is very different from the algebraic manipulations you see textbooks use to get there. The one on the left shows how the second postulate ensures different flows of time in different inertial frames. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.